Howdy folks, welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Ending Explained, we're looking at the Hulu original Run, where a homeschooled teenager begins to suspect her mother is keeping a dark secret from her, but will find that you can't escape a mother's love. There's a lot to like about this tense little thriller from the filmmakers behind the surprisingly good searching, and Run shows them honing their style further into a different format. Now this was originally set to come out in theaters earlier this year, and I remember being intrigued by the trailer that looked quite nerve wracking. And well, Sarah Paulson is always amazing. Anyway, Run does what it does and does it well. It admittedly does get a bit ludicrous at times, but eh, who cares? It worked for me. What the story is really about at its core is the mental disorder Munchausen syndrome by proxy, where a caregiver makes up or causes an illness to someone under their care. And Run does a great job at unfolding the scenario. And things take an even more frightening turn when Mother Diana is known to be a threat. What's also really interesting about this is the direction the ending goes, that chooses to make things not as simple as villain and hero, revealing something more complex and tying into the movie's overall story. So let's check out Run, breaking down the story and its big twists, along with looking at the ending and its surprising implications for our protagonist. An EKG machine beeps in an operating room stuffed with doctors, one trying to get a baby to breathe via CPR. In another room, Mother Diane sits with her hands clenched in bed. An orderly brings her a wheelchair and she's carted into the room to see her newborn. She wheels up to the incubator and peers inside, starting to tear up. We see the baby isn't moving, and Diane starts to bawl, asking if she will be okay. Uh, I don't think so, lady, that baby ain't moving. Quickly establishing how a kind of mental disconnect occurs due to her baby's passing. The screen is then filled with different maladies and their definitions, like asthma, diabetes, and dang, there's even more, paralysis. Highlighting the last word of its definition, RUN. In some kind of mom support group, we hear a woman softly crying, asking who is going to tell him to brush his teeth before bed. The leader of the group apologizes, assuring her thousands of parents go through this every year. She comes to Diane asking how she feels, clearly not invested, fiddling with her phone. She brings up that her daughter Chloe is going to college in a few months. Diane's saying that she feels good, and besides, they technically haven't heard back from any schools yet. She goes on that she's taken care of her for 17 years, her entire life revolving around her daughter, never traveling or dating or anything. So yeah, she feels goddamn great about getting some personal time. The leader about to ask her something else, she interrupts, calling Chloe brave, smart, and face more difficult physical challenges than most, asserting that she is not someone to worry about. Chloe wakes up at 6.45, hearing a steady, slow heartbeat. She groans and gets herself into her wheelchair and goes to the toilet, coughing and spitting up, and applies a cream to some skin rashes. The next step is pills, a whole bunch in organizers for each day and uses a lift in her chair to get downstairs, already understanding there's quite a lot of ailments going on here, having to go through a quite intricate routine to even start her day. Diane whips her up an omelet and pricks her finger for a diabetes test, finding her levels a little high. About to inject her with insulin, Chloe takes the needle and does it herself, Diane proudly watching. She helps her with some physical rehab and plays the role of teacher too, assigning her some physics and lit and bio later in the day. In the afternoon, she takes more pills and right at four, the mailman comes, Chloe rushing to the front door in hopes of a college letter, but mom is already there with the mail. Chloe, short of breath, Diane tells her to use her inhaler, Chloe insisting she's fine. She promises that if any college letter does come, that she'll deliver it straight to her, ordering her back to her studies. Diane tends to her quite substantial garden, boasting some plump tomatoes there, and uses the produce in cooking dinner. Pretty resourceful there, actually. Now her levels are low, and Chloe gets to have candy. Well, one piece. Ha <laughs> too slow. Clearly Chloe is excited about the potential of going to college, watching University of Washington videos, barely registering when her mom asks when the last time they watched a movie together was, stammering that she doesn't know. She's also quite crafty, working on engineering a 3D printing machine, but finds that it doesn't work to her frustration. Her mom asks what's wrong with it, firing back, well, if I had an iPhone that I could tell you. Diane chuckling, you'll figure it out, and gives her even more meds, good lord. It's a lot of meds. Diane takes a glass of wine to the basement and turns on some old home videos of Chloe as a child making some cake batter. A pleased grin stretching across her face. Woo wee, obsessed much? Five minutes in and I'm already like, yo lady, you need a back off. Oh. The next morning, back to class, she sees a car approaching. It's mom with some groceries, sensing a kind of longing for stimulation from Chloe here, who is constantly trapped in the house alone. Diane gets a call and goes outside complaining of bad reception, and Chloe takes the opportunity to check the 
goods, sneaking a handful of chocolates, and something else catches her eye. A bottle of prescription medication, and it's labeled for Diane, not Chloe. Uh-oh. She barely makes it in the nick of time as Diane returns with bad news. Her old med company went out of business, and she had to switch prescriptions. I don't believe anything that you're saying already. She point blank asks Diane in confusion, aren't they yours? Mine, she scoffs. Why would you think that? She divulges that she saw the label, but clearly gaslighting her lies. It's just the receipt, silly. Chloe's still not quite buying it. She likes to take the pills anyway, but in the morning stares at them weighing whether to keep taking them. And while we don't actually see, the answer is no. She crafts an extending arm with her assortment of Radio Shack wizardry and utilizes it to reach the pill bottle from the top shelf. She hears a car approaching, but it's just the Daily Mail delivery. She tries to get to the mail in a rush, but surprisingly, mom got to it first again. Man, where the heck did she even come from? And based on her door still being open, she must have rushed home to beat her to it. When she does get some privacy, she investigates the pills called Trigoxin. And strangely, the label now has Chloe's name on it as she insisted. However, a quick peel reveals the real label underneath. Well, yep, she's in danger. And later it sounds at first like Diane has her peg, chuffing you figured it out, but is only referring to her project and hands her more pills. She wishes her good night. Love you too, sweet tooth, she replies. Chloe sits idly for a few moments and spits the pills out and inspects one that physically matches the trigoxin bottle. Waiting for Diane to go to sleep, she sneaks downstairs for some internet sleuthing. Her plan is kiboshed when trying to do a search and gets the terrible T-Rex of no internet connection. Blast you, mother. Creepily, seeing Diane is awake and watching from her bed. Starting her routine as usual at 6.45, she hears her mom arguing with the internet customer support, making a really big dramatic scene about it. Even though we know, of course, she's the one that took out the signal. She's told that there's nothing they can do and hangs up. When asked how long it will be down, she gives the vague answer of maybe tomorrow or the next day or even by the end of the month. Man, what the heck? Just get a new service already at that point. Diane quizzes her about how she knew the internet was down. Chloe chews in thought and fibs that she was trying to find info on her faulty 3D printer. She asked if she did figure it out. Well, no, I didn't have internet, ma, geez. When Diane is busy with her garden, she seizes the chance for other ways to find out about the pill. First, she calls the pharmacy, but is forced to hang up when they recognize her voice as her mom's, which is a little weird. She tries again with 411. I didn't even know that was still around. That takes a painfully long time having to answer the city and all that. And in a kind of fun reference, the recording suggests something like Derry, Maine. Ah, uh, the setting of Stephen King's It. She finally gets the number for the pharmacy and is about to connect, but the service charges to connect and knowing that she'd get caught has to try another more desperate measure. She literally just dials random numbers and gets connected with some dude, causing an argument with him and his girlfriend. He's more annoyed than anything, saying that he doesn't have time to help. She tries to appeal to his ego that his girl will be back, since she couldn't stay away from such a level-headed, reasonable guy. He finally bends and asks what the hell she wants and asks him to do a search spelling out the drug's name. Of course, he takes his sweet time for freaking out about being caught and reads that it's for treating heart conditions and can cause heart failure. Him all, oh man, that's bad. You take that? She has to look up an image and what is the color? Red, it turns out, making it seem that Chloe got it all wrong about Diane again. As she says, in that case, then what the hell are you? During dinner, Chloe repeats what her mom asked prior, if they can go see a movie. She clearly has more on her mind than popcorn, psyching herself up and empties out her piggy bank, scooping all the pills while mom honks to get a move on. Don't want to miss those trailers. Ah, uh, I remember seeing movies in theaters. I remember. Yeah. I can smell that popcorn right now, baby. They pull into the quaint downtown for a screening of the appropriately titled Breakout and keep an eye out for fake news coming soon. Definitely check. Check that out. In the theater, Chloe appears distracted and excuses herself to use the bathroom. Diane suspecting nothing, but still anxiously watching her leave. Troubled to even let her out of her sight for a moment. She frantically crosses the street to the pharmacy where there is an inordinately long line. And naturally up front is an old lady taking her sweet ass time. She asks the guy in the back if she can cut who shuts her down until noticing her in a wheelchair. And she just goes for broke, jumping through the whole line, yelling about how she's paralyzed, feel bad for me, and rushes to the front, asking the pharmacist what the pill is. She says, oh, no big deal. As long as it's in your name. Well, it's her mom's. And in that case, can't tell her due to confidentiality. Noticing the pharmacist in a photo at an escape room, she changes tactics, saying it's all a big game, a scavenger hunt between her and Diane. And the next clue is about the meds. Stoneface, she says she loves games, but after thinking a moment, says that it's a trick question because she doesn't get them prescribed for herself, but for the dog. They don't even have a dog. <laughs> How does that work? It's Rhydocaine, it turns out, asking about the color 
and yep, it's the same one she's been taking. She continues on that it's a muscle relaxant for the legs. Chloe asking, what if a human were to take it? She's confused by the question, who would do that? But what if they did, she fires back. Diane comes running in, her time almost up. Well, your legs could go numb, making it sound like it was actually this that caused Chloe's paralysis in her legs. Pretty messed up, Diane. Chloe is so horrified that she can't even breathe. And mom sends her away to get an ice bucket and rubs Chloe's face, assuring her it's gonna be okay. No, she chokes and mom jams her with an injection, instantly causing her vision to go blurry and slumps down unconscious. Diane cooing, you're gonna be okay. I got you, my sweet girl. She takes her to bed, still passed out. Must be some serious stuff that she gave her. Taking a shower, Diane appears concerned over losing Chloe. Also noticing she has some strange slash scars on her back and pushing things even further, Praxis is calling the pharmacist to try to convince her that Diane would never give her drugs med for animals. And even if she was, that is perfectly safe. Really crossing the line there to convince her that she's helping. Yeah, not so much lady, but she can't do it. So she tries to send an aggressive email to the doctor blaming him, but stops herself deleting it, knowing that her charade is starting to crumble. Another thought occurs to her, Googling household neurotoxins. Good Lord, Diane, getting out of hand here, man. Chloe comes to finding food left for her on the nightstand and immediately bolts for the door, alarmingly finding it locked. She shouts through the door that she just wants to talk, appealing that she's sure that there's a logical explanation for everything, begging her please to no response. She looks out the window, seeing only tire tracks, knowing that she isn't home. Finally, she has a chance to get the hell out of here, the only logical course at this point. She uses some Allen wrenches to pick the lock and gets it fairly easily, but is stopped once more, seeing a rake or something has been jammed on the other side to keep her trapped here. She surveys the room. Hey, GameCube, nice. And there is another option, the window. Not an easy one, that's for sure. She checks her levels and they're low. So she fuels up, scarfing down the food and attaches a bunch of extension cords together and knots them tight and grabs her U of W blanket and lastly fills her mouth with water and is ready to begin the treacherous journey. She flops out on the roof and starts grunting herself across to the another window. She plugs in the cord for her soldering iron and jams it into the glass, starting to crack. The process is sped up by spitting the water on it and it shatters in seconds. Dang, that's some crafty stuff there, Chloe. She hauls herself over the window, using the blanket to cover the shards of glass and falls to the floor, heaving. She suddenly can't breathe and gasps. She checks her pocket for her nailer, but no dice, forcing her back to her room in a hurry. Well, as fast as she can, dragging herself along the floor, also noticing that the landline has been severed. She gets the thing out of the way and makes it to her dresser, getting the inhaler in time and can breathe once again. Next step is getting downstairs, loading herself into the lift, but unfortunately when pressing the button finds the power has been turned off. She strains to push the chair over, clattering to the floor below. Leaning on the lift, it gives way and she tumbles down the stairs after. She's okay and even more surprisingly looks down to her foot and is able to wiggle one of her toes, Chloe tearing up and laughing in disbelief. She wrangles herself into the chair and bolts outside at full speed. Of course, Diane looking disturbed is on the way back home, seeing a hardware store in the back seat. Hmm, I wonder what's in there. Chloe makes it out to the road and sees a car approaching. She slinks back into the trees, but it's not her mom, it's the mailman. Save me, mailman! She tries to wheel out, getting stuck for a sec, but breaks free, rolling out right in front of the truck, slamming on his brakes right in front of her. Oh, hey, it's Pat Healy, nice surprise there. He appears concerned, asking what happened, as mom picks up speed and approaches from the other way. Chloe blubbers that she saw me, and he takes her around the back of the truck, telling her to wait here. Diane comes to a stop in the road. She yells out that she's worried. Is she okay? He informs her Chloe said, in fact, she's the one that hurt her. She defensively says, how could you believe I could hurt my own daughter? The whole disconnect thing rearing its head once more because you are definitely not helping here. She uses the old excuse of her meds being changed and tries to push past him. He stops her and she threatens to call 911, asking him to think how bad it would sound. An adult man found with a young girl bleeding and bruised and walks off, him chuffing that there's no reception here. She gets even more irritated, yelling, you know how many people she's had to deal with? Normal, healthy people like him that only make things worse. And those who won't believe when a mother says her child is sick and begs to let her take Chloe home. He sighs, he can't. And she nods, saying it's okay, but actually looks like she's about to explode inside, asking if it's okay to follow them to the hospital. He asks Chloe if she wants the police or the hospital. Police, she decides. Mom goes to the first aid kit in her trunk, which also handily includes a gun. Ted gets Chloe some water, warmly telling her he will drive real slow. And if any boxes fall down, he starts. But before finishing, mom gets him in the neck with an injection, causing him to fall unconscious instantly. Chloe starts hyperventilating again, Diane staring back blankly. She wakes up in the basement, and it looks like mom has a pot of something going. She takes a spoon out, and it's a gloopy mess, assumedly paint or something from the hardware store. She goes to the trash can, seeing a 
Telltale logo sticking out and pulls out an acceptance letter from the University of Washington. Congratulations in big bold letters at the top. And upon seeing this, Chloe is destroyed. Jeez, mom, really screwing up my life here. Across the room, she sees a bunch of file boxes, including one marked Diane. She tries to roll over to investigate and finds that her chair has been chained, but doesn't let this stop her crawling out of her chair to the box. She flips through the contents, finding photos of her when younger, along with some letters. She pulls out one with a sticky note on it marked as Chloe's B-Day 2006 and peels it away, seeing she's using her legs just fine, apparently, despite her mom saying she's been in a wheelchair her whole life. The damning evidence piles up further, discovering a death certificate for Chloe, who was alive for a scant two hours and 11 minutes, certainly the baby from the opening, and is using this Chloe to replace her lost daughter. This is further confirmed in a newspaper article about a newborn being snatched from a hospital, which I'm not sure why Diane would keep, but okay. Memento of the day that I stole a baby. We flash back to that night, asking if real Chloe will be okay, and then seen holding her dead baby yell crying, and then looking more stern and disconnected, stares through the window into the newborn wing. Another one is rolled in, and the nurses leave, and she looks in consideration all, I could just take that baby, putting her hands on the glass. Pretty F, Diane, gotta say. Chloe breaks down in tears at this revelation, understanding her whole life has been a lie, and mommy's back, appearing in shadow at the top of the stairs. Chloe, what are you doing? She calmly asks. She sees the article out and whoops, the jig is up, Diane. Chloe seethes. You're not my real mom. Yes, yes I am, she interrupts. Then states more assertively, I'm your mom. Then who are they? She asks. No one, she says. They don't matter. You took me from them, she cries, replying, I saved you from them. She tenderly pushes her hair away, telling Chloe no one in the universe loves their kid more than her and that everything she does is for you. Uh, wow, sure have a strange way of showing it there, lady. Chloe then asks the million dollar question. Was she actually ever sick? But delusional Diane only asked to know if there was one time that she wasn't a good mom to her. She's not having it, spitting, could I walk? Was my heartbeat normal and all that stuff? You were sick, Diane whispers, asking if she knows how many times she took her to the hospital. Yeah, it's because you poisoned me, as she says. She covers her mouth, insisting she protected her. In desperation, Diane throws out the pills and offers to start all over and forget about all this and go back to how things used to be, casually holding out her hand to shake an agreement. Uh, hell no, you wacko. There's no going back. You've been, I can't use my legs no more because of your crazy shit. Looking at her acceptance letter, she maintains everything she did was for you, crying to take her hand. Chloe corrects she didn't do it for her, but for herself. That's not true, she calmly states and unlocks a closet, pulling out an IV machine along with her bag from the store. She pours a healthy amount of paint thinner into the pot. Chloe keeps asking what she's doing. She snaps her attention back. Please don't do something bad, she sobs. Please, mom. But she is undeterred, taking some of the sludge into a syringe. Chloe backing away, crying that she doesn't want to die. She emotionally tells her that she would never do that. Don't say that. Uh, you're literally trying to kill her right now. What? <laughs> okay. Chloe locks herself in the closet and Diane tries the handle. It rattles. Sweetheart, open the door, she requests. She asks her to understand she's doing what's right for her. Please don't be scared or cry. I'm not gonna hurt you. She continues. This is gonna make you forget all this. And when you wake up, I'll be right by your side and you'll be my baby forever. Making it sound like she's going to kill Chloe and then herself. She knocks more aggressively, commanding her to open the door. And Chloe notices a shit ton of meds on the shelves and pulls down a bottle of something that warns if ingested, call 911 immediately. The door unlocks. You need me, Chloe growls and chugs the bottle. Diane screams, no, 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 and searches the shelves for some hydrogen peroxide to get her to vomit. Chloe already coughing up blood. Diane is able to save her at least, now in the hospital and hooked up to a breathing tube. A machine beeps and boops and she wakes up, fluttering her eyes. Appearing even more paralyzed than before, she tries to move her index finger but can barely get it to move. Diane discusses with the doctors and wants her out of here as soon as possible, confused as she was told that Chloe was stable. The doctors inform her that due to it being a potential suicide, she's considered a high risk patient, so they have to keep an eye on her for longer. Diane weakly brings up her old line about recently changing doctors, but that's not gonna work this time. She goes to visit Chloe, placing her hand on the window outside her room, and a callback to when she first stole her 17 years ago. At the mere sight of Diane, Chloe starts hyperventilating and tries to get the doc's attention. She again tries her weak finger for the emergency button and with a fresh wave of determination gets it there. The doc asks what's up, but she can't speak either, using her eyes to indicate her pen. She can't do that for suicide concerns, but hands over a nice safe crayon and piece of paper. She grunts weakly, struggling to write, and is interrupted by a code blue calling the doctor away and causing a general atmosphere of chaos in the halls. Perfect for Diane, who certainly called the alarm. Chloe's heartbeat skyrockets, then goes 
goes to a flat line, her mom standing there holding the unplugged cable. With some labor, she removes the breathing tube and moves her to a wheelchair to escape. No one picking up on what's going on. And Chloe is all super paralyzed and shit. They get in an elevator and after the door is closed, Diane whispers in her ear that what she said stuck with her, knowing that she scared her and hurt her, at least admitting that, and promises she will spend every minute of our lives making sure she never feels that way. You were right, she admits. I do need you. And knows deep down, Chloe needs her too. I'm your mom, she definitively states. Downstairs, Chloe fails to catch anyone's attention, her toe wiggling again. While back in her room, the doc finds she's gone. Uh, seems like it's been a while since you checked on your patient there and it was a flat line and everything. And to draw things out a bit further, she calls in asking someone if the patient was moved. They don't know anything about it. And she finally puts the pieces together. She pulls back the sheet, seeing the word mom written by Chloe. So can you get her some help already, please, lady? The announcer calls for security to the south wing, Diane cocking her gun, ready for a fight, but are stopped by a simple obstacle. A massive set of stairs and the escalator is out of order. What to do? Chloe sees a banner for the University of Washington campus and with renewed vigor, stands her ground. Diane tries to start pushing her down the stairs, but finds that she can't, Chloe using her legs to stop her. She slurs, I don't need you. You will, she groans. We're going home and pulls up her gun. A shot is fired into her shoulder, looking back in pain at Chloe, and she falls all the way down the stairs, lying motionless, and Chloe's nightmare is finally over. Although perhaps nightmare isn't exactly the best way to describe things in the end, as things are a bit more complicated than that when we pick up seven years later to a car driving down frost-lined roads. It's Chloe driving, so that's a good thing. A prison gate's buzzed, and Chloe is greeted by a guard, asking how she's doing, replying the same as the last decade, you know. She asks if she needs some help. No thanks, Chloe tells her, and whips out an unfolding cane, standing on her own two legs and walks through the security check, and gets back to her chair smiling proudly. Her walks have gotten better, the employee notices. Her trainers say it may improve or may not, but she's happy either way. Surprisingly, she is paying a seemingly regular visit to Diane and has moved on to helping others like her in the past years, giving her updates on several of her patients, all taken in by a silent and sullen looking Diane. It's good to see you, mom, she stammers, and telling her it's time to go. Diane's heartbeat quickens, and Chloe spits out three of those same pills. I love you, mom, she says. And Diane blinks, her eyes now wide open. Looks like the tables have turned there, Diane. Ha <laughs> ha, gotcha, sucker. But as I said, this last scene makes things a bit more complicated in their relationship. Because as far as I'm concerned, I would not be visiting this crazy lady that tortured me for years and made it so I can't walk and everything, you know what I mean? Especially as it's made clear that Chloe knows the staff quite well and must have paid several visits here, not even like once or once every couple of years or whatever, but often. And she even still calls her mom after all that, which makes it seem like there is a kind of two-way thing that has developed here. We all know about Diane's Munchausen stuff, but it appears that Chloe has developed Stockholm Syndrome and has grown real feelings of love for Diane due to how she was so intertwined with her for so many years. I mean, literally her entire life for 17 years was this woman. So it seems they have a kind of weird real bond and love for each other, despite it being completely unhealthy and twisted on so many levels. Just an interesting direction to go with the whole thing. Although we do see that in spite of this weird lingering relationship with Diane, Chloe's life has flourished without her abuse and is now helping others with physical disabilities and learning to overcome her own as well. So that's more positive than weird in the end. With that, we have reached the conclusion of this inning explained for run. I quite dug this one. It was really suspenseful and I do appreciate the ending for making things less black and white than I would have expected. Makes the whole thing a lot more interesting to me. And of course, the acting was great. Sarah Paulson is just perfectly suited for these broken, complicated characters. And as usual, does a bang up job. Also great job to the searching guys for doing something totally different here, but still thrilling and successful in its own right. And don't forget before we go, you can send me a request for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Ron and its ending? Would you have continued your relationship with your fake mother after she repeatedly tried to kill you? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.